This week we are reading from Zephaniah and Habakkuk, which used to be called Minor Prophets. And today we're going to look at some information that perhaps gives a better title for the last 12 books of the Old Testament. When I was growing up, I was shown uh, this pie chart uh, with the various sections of the Old Testament, uh, beginning with the Pentateuch and then moving on to the historical books, then uh, to the poetic books like the Psalms and Proverbs, to the major prophets, and then finally, uh, last and usually treated as least, were the minor prophets. And this always bothered me for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, it's confusing. What kind of minors are we talking about? Uh, certainly it's not the kind of miners who are working here in the picture deep in the grounds under the ground in South Africa and yet it's it's still confusing it makes it sound like uh, these prophets are not as important that they're minor in importance and that is not at all the case they were, of course were called minor prophets simply because they were shorter in content than well the major prophets There's a new title uh, for this section of the Bible, and it's interesting because the new title really is the ancient title. Scholars now call this section the Book of the Twelve. Now, this is what the ancient Hebrews called uh, this section of Scripture, and so it's a good place for us to turn to a more appropriate and more elevated term for uh, these great books, which have a lot of power and a lot of significance. Uh, the Jewish Bible, the Tanakh, uh, treats these 12 books as one book. Uh, there's only one book title, although every once in a while it's kind of like a new paragraph or a new um, phase. There is uh, the listing of the new author. But to treat it as one book, it's um, one scroll in most of the ancient Hebrew collections. And so there's this sense that these 12 writings, and often in the Jewish literature they're called individually writings and then a book as the whole of the twelve. And so this gives us an interesting perspective because it, it speaks to the unity of the book of the twelve. Now the unity is not built upon the nationality uh, because the, some of the writers were from Israel and others were from Judah at a time when those two nations did not get along very well. Um, they're not unified in who they were written to. Some were addressed to Israel, um, some to Judah, other to pagan countries like Assyria. And certainly, they are not unified in, in the station of life from which they are written. That the writers, um, some of the writers were court paid officials who were spent all the time in the face of the king. Others were, were farmers who very rarely, if ever, saw the king. And so the unity is not built upon the nationality, the destination, the, or, uh, the origin, or even the type of people who delivered the messages. Rather, the, the unity of the Book of the Twelve is that these men were sharing the same task and the same message. They all were speaking for God, and they gave equally grave warnings, interspersed with some glimmers of hope and always God's promise. But they were sharing the same task and the same message, and there's a unity, and we should be looking for the unity in these 12 writings by the 12 writers of the 12, as much as we would their dissimilarities, their differences. The unifying theme may be the day of the Lord. And certainly if you wanted to come up with a different unifying theme, it would be interesting to see your justification of that and you might have a very good idea. But many of the Book of the Twelve describe the day of the Lord, which for the most part is the day of punishment. It's a day of punishment for Israel, it's a day of punishment for Judah, and it's a day of punishment for the Gentiles, which are called the nations. So here we need to take a short time out for politics. Not politics of today's age, but politics of the period which is 
600 to 400 BC. During the time of the prophetic books, Israel and Judah are not the same. Israel represents the ten tribes who separated during Rehoboam's range, reign, and they had their capital in a city called Samaria. They were the northern kingdom. Judah represented the two southern tribes with its capital in Jerusalem, much smaller and yet usually more powerful politically, and that swayed back and forth. These two countries fought against each other quite a bit. Very rarely during the time of their divided kingdom were they really on good terms with each other. And so Israel and Judah is not the same. They're, they're two different things. And when we read to Judah, we should read, oh, okay, this is written to the northern kingdom. And it does not include Judah. And then vice versa when something is addressed to Judah. I've seen that in the book of Amos. So here's the divided kingdom. There is Israel in the north, which is a much larger area, with its capital of Samaria. And then there is Judah in the south, a smaller area, with its capital in Jerusalem. And one thing that should, you should see right away is how close Jerusalem is, just a few miles from the international boundary with the nation of Israel, which created all sorts of problems for Jerusalem. So the prophets often refer to the nations, which you should remind yourself whenever you see that, that's not just saying a bunch of other political entities. Rather, it is the same word for the Gentile, the Gentiles. It's a religious term almost more than it is political. Um, a similar phrase for us today in our churches might be unbelievers or, or even the godless. And until just recently when Pagan took on a different uh, specific phrase, but when I was growing up we used the word pagans to talk about people who had really no love for God, no even understanding of God. Today unbelievers or godless would work. And it describes the same kind of feeling that the writer of the Twelve the books of the Twelve, and the major prophets as well, the kind of feelings and kind of relationship they had towards the people they called the nations. Those are the Gentiles, those are the people outside of God's family of faith. And so as we look at the, the day of the Lord, we see that God will punish his people, but also all people. Publish the people, publish, punish the people of faith, and punish the people who have no faith. In so doing, God is reestablishing his sovereignty. That the story, kind of the backstory behind the prophets, is that for hundreds of years, it had looked like the people of faith, as well as the people around them, had gotten away with flagrant violations of God's rule and had never had to pay the consequences. The prophets say, wait a minute, God's still in charge, and on the day of the Lord, he's going to demonstrate how much he still is in control and how much he weighs good and evil and consequences for them in his hands. And so the big picture for interpretation is that the 12 writings in the book of the 12 are connected by message. As we look through Zephaniah and Habakkuk and Hosea and Joel and the like, we should be thinking, what is the one message the one message which was delivered in different times by different men, by different two different nations, and through all sorts of different circumstances. Through all of those differences, what is it that's the unifying message which is being delivered by those faithful servants of the Lord? And if Sweeney is right, then the real big question to say is from each of the book of the twelve. What is the new lesson, the new aspect, the new facet, the new dynamic of God's sovereignty? Who is he sovereign over? How does he exercise his sovereignty? What are the obstacles to his sovereignty? And so as you're going through Zephaniah and Habakkuk, you might be looking at, you know, what am I learning about God's sovereignty as I'm reading through this one of the books of the Twelve? 
And now for a word from our course project. This Friday, you will turn in the first segment of your profit project. This would be a good time to reread the whole of the PDF that I posted at the top of our e-course, the profit project PDF. Uh, I think it'd be a good time to read this. This is the most important thing that you will do both in terms of points and percentage for the course, but also in terms of the lasting impact on your life and, and your ministry. Basically, the profit project would be your ability to give a creative application to these five essential elements. So it's creative in the sense that it might be a sermon or a song or a drama or a poem, but the things that they each will have is a phase of mourning, over sin, a praise, a promise of what God wants to deliver, theology, ex explaining God's nature, and a call for specific action by the intended audience, all of which, all four of those, which are grounded very solidly in Scripture. That's the prophet project in the big picture. This week's assignment is to carefully choose a situation that you want a prophecy about. So by current situation, I mean don't rail against um, Assyria and the way that they were so ruthless 2,500 years ago. But you might want to think about a situation today of a country that is ruthless and when it, when it goes to war. More likely there will be a situation even closer to home, but a current situation that you want a prophecy about. Now, last week's assignment, by the way, which asked you to keep a track of those things of which made God angry was well, to kind of prime the pump for this assignment. It may help, it may not. Uh, I certainly hope that it sensitized you to the fact that there still are things about today's world which really get God angry, which uh, invoke his wrath. And so what I want you to do, uh, this is an email to me assignment. It's not one that you post and uh, you'll do it step by step. The very final project once it's all put together and you've had time to, to proof it and to revise it, to really make it shine, the final project, the very last week of class, you will post. But the individual parts, you just email to me and I'll give you feedback. So what you do on Friday is you want to email to me the current condition you want to prophesy against. For instance, it might be a problem inside the church that the church is not taken seriously enough. It might even be some sin in the church. It might be... Um, an attitude or sin that the world accepts, but God condemns. So pick a current condition you want to prophesy against, and then the Old Testament prophet passage that addresses a similar problem. This is an Old Testament prophet's course, and so your biblical theology, your biblical grounding, should at least be rooted in the Old Testament prophets. If there's a little bit that you have that that spreads into the New Testament, you, you reinforce it, that's fine, but the core of it should obviously be from the Hebrew prophets. So here are the works that I cited for the, the part. Uh, the Dictionary of the Old Testament Prophets is a wonderful resource. It's practically brand new and has some great and helpful information. If you have a chance to buy this or even to browse it in our library, I think that you would be blessed for having done so.